Welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Happy Hour Weekly. I am your host, Chris Wright. I'm so happy to be back. I was sick, out sick for a week. I'm feeling a little better. You might hear a little scratchiness in my voice, but that's okay. But I'm going to ask you a question. Does a major federal credit union have discriminatory practices that severely affects minority home ownership. We're going to talk about that when we get back, as well as talk about a couple of movies that I've watched on Netflix this week. I want to talk a little politics, but I'm so happy to be back. And on the other side, I'll see you there. This is the Real Estate Happy Hour, and I'm your host, Chris Wright. It's a fun place where we talk real estate, pop culture, and what's trending. Hey, I might even give you some good advice. So grab yourself a drink, sit back, relax, and take a listen. Unless you're driving, of course. I'll see you guys on the other side. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back uh, with the Real Estate Happy Hour Weekly. This is episode eight, actually. Uh, we're getting up there. Um, but I want to talk about uh, a major federal credit union um, who have been accused of having discriminatory practices that severely affects minority home ownership. I want to get into that. Now, personally, I tend not to, not to get too triggered by stories like this because I understand how the media works. You mentioned race. And everybody's head just explode. And I try my damnedest, especially being a black man, not to let the media affect my emotions or how I feel about things or how I see the world. My worldview is not based on skin color. My worldview is not based on race. Um, I catch a lot of heat uh, from people within my race. Um, I've been called everything from Uncle Tom to Coon to um, you name it, um, I, that I just don't support um, the black mission or I'm not in I'm not in the fight, um, but I am in other ways because I've I'm a, a, I'm a history buff and I've watched black people thrive in all types of conditions in the worst of conditions through slavery, through, through slavery, through Jim Crow through the 19th century after Jim Crow, through the Civil War. There's a book a book out called Black Gotham that I highly recommend everyone read, black, white, or otherwise, how during the Gilded Age, during the, the late 1800s, when um, historically there were tons of upper middle class black people, pharmacists, like you don't even know this, but one of the one of the key contributors to the electric light that helped Thomas Edison was a black man. Like there, we thrived. We had black senators, black politicians, all throughout history. We have had black inventors and people who have contributed to society. So I don't like to hear what we're incapable of. I only like, like to talk about what we are capable of. And that was with, without affirmative action, without blaming systemic racism. I just believe that we are powerful people. All of us, black, white, indifferent, yellow, red. I think that we're children of God and it is God who controls how we succeed. It is our own will and our power that determines our success and our fate. So, yeah, but I take a lot of heat and that's why I don't get triggered by race stories. All right. So um, the nation's largest credit union rejected more than half its black conventional mortgage applications. And that credit union that we're talking, going to talk about is the Navy Federal Credit Union. Now, before I show you this video, I want to talk about my experience with the Navy Federal Credit Union. As you know, I am a veteran. All right. I think I've talked about that before. And if you didn't, yes, I served, I served 10 years in the United States Navy. And one of my first experiences as a young 18, 19 year old with banking was with, with Navy Federal Credit Union. And I had a very, very good experience. Um, I think in, I wanted to buy my mom's car. So they gave me a loan of $5,000 and I had a really, really good relationship. I am no longer with Navy Federal Credit Union. That's only because I moved out of areas where the branches exist. I think there's like one branch in the area that I currently live in, but um, nothing but good things to say about Navy Federal Credit Union. As a real estate agent, I've actually helped a lot of 
uh, members uh, that have accounts at or who are members of Navy Federal Credit Union. One thing I do want to point out is that the Navy Federal Credit Union um, is not affiliated, affiliated with the Navy and they're not affiliated with the federal government. They're just regulated by federal government credit union rules and regulations. All right. So it's not a Navy entity. OK, so that's really important to know. But before we get started, um, let's watch this video and I'll be right back. Baba Tandi, a Kenyan immigrant turned Texas entrepreneur, knew this was his dream home the moment he saw it. It's in a highly sought after school district that his son so desperately wanted to attend for its basketball program. Tandi's first choice for his mortgage was Navy Federal Credit Union. It services military members, defense personnel, veterans and their families and is the largest credit union in the country. I was the CEO of my company, so I had a pretty good income. Your credit was in the 700s. Mm -hmm. You had recently sold your house. Mm -hmm. You had $100,000 for the down payment, which was more than 20%. Correct. I mean, one more could we ask for? CNN reviewed Otandi's financial documents. He even had a pre-approval letter from Navy Federal in hand, but just two weeks before closing. They got a denial. They sent me a letter saying, we're sorry, but your application has been denied. The denial letter listed excessive obligations in relation to income as the reason. When they denied is when we came back and said, oh man, there's something else going on. And what did you think that something else was? A discrimination. But it wasn't just a Tandi. Thousands of other black applicants were also rejected. According to a CNN analysis of federal consumer protection data, last year, Navy Federal Credit Union only approved 48 percent. That's less than half of its black applicants for conventional home mortgages. White borrowers were approved more than 75 percent of the time. It's the biggest gap among the top 50 lenders. The data also shows Navy Federal was more than twice as likely to deny black mortgage applicants than white ones, even when different variables, including income, debt, property value, and down payment percentage were the same. Navy Federal Credit Union denied CNN's request for an on-camera interview. In a statement, it said it is committed to equal and equitable lending practices and that CNN's recent analysis does not account for major criteria required by any financial institution to approve a mortgage loan. That includes credit scores, which are not public. Navy Federal declined to provide additional data. We asked Navy Federal why Bob Otandi's loan was denied, but they declined to comment, citing member privacy. CNN's analysis does not prove discrimination, but it does show dramatic racial disparities in who Navy Federal rejects and approves for conventional mortgage loans. Lisa Rice has spent decades as a fair housing advocate. She says the disparities in Navy Federal's lending data are alarming and an extreme example of a bigger problem. It's definitely a larger systemic issue. And we know that we have a long history of redlining and a long history of lending discrimination in this nation. Well, all of that, that data that is sort of tainted with bias is being used to develop the credit scoring systems. Well, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which oversees consumer lending, uh, says that they do not comment on specific institutions, but they do conduct their own investigations to ensure that banks and credit unions are following fair lending practices, Jake. All right, so there's some there's some key points I want to I want to talk about in this story. This was a CNN story. I know how some of you feel about CNN, but neither here nor there. They told a story. They're a major network, and we're going to talk about it. So um, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, the key points in this story. You got to be really really careful not to just focus on the race aspect of this. You got to be really really careful not to just look at Black, white. This is about words. So one of the one, let's start with this. All right. The nation's largest credit union rejected more than half of its black conventional mortgage applicants. That's very important. The word conventional. Now, I don't know if CNN made a mistake by putting that word or if that was intentional because conventional is a type of loan. 
We have conventional loans. We have FHA loans. There are VA loans. There are USDA loans. What type of loan do you think the Navy Federal Credit Union would push? They probably would push a VA loan because the majority of its, its membership are veterans or family of veterans. This particular story said more than half its black conventional mortgage applicants were rejected. So if that's the case, you have to ask yourself, hmm, why wouldn't those members apply for a VA loan? And I think I've talked about this before. Maybe I haven't. But in the seller's competitive market that we were that we are in and we were in in 2020, 2021, VA loans were getting were getting rejected by sellers at a very high rate. So a lot of veterans opted to get a conventional loan. They might have qualified for a VA loan over a conventional loan. OK, so that's one point I want to make. There was also uh, a video that I talked about financial literacy in America as a whole. And I'm speaking extremely general. Who has the who has more financial literacy in America, blacks or whites? Let's just say whites, because it's the truth. Where I grew up, financial literacy wasn't something we talked about. Saving for a home, buying a house, loan types, credit scores, just wasn't kitchen table discussion in my house. Maybe in a lot of white families, there are. So are there, there's going to be some variance, some disparaging differences, some disproportionate differences when it comes to black home ownership and white home ownership and how to acquire these homes, all right? So <clears throat> that sentence, I wanna go back and repeat it again. The nation's largest credit union rejected more than half its black conventional mortgage applications. So for me, that's a problem right there in that word. <clears throat> I'll go on, excuse me. The largest credit union in the United States has the widest disparity in mortgage approval rates between white and black borrowers of any major lender. A trend that's reached new heights last year, a CNN analyst found. Goes on to say, Navy Federal Credit Union, which lends to military service members and veterans, approved more than 75% of the white borrowers who applied for new conventional home purchase mortgages in 2022. See, they keep tricking you up with this word conventional. According, and, and I'm going to say this, because Navy Federal Credit Union probably does more VA loans than conventional loans, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the number, but I'm going to say we may be taking from a very small sample size. I'm not the attorney or the defense mechanism for white America. I'm just saying I want to put some context to this story. All right. It says they approved 75% of the white borrowers who applied for new conventional home purchases in 2022, according to the most recent data available from Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But less than 50% of black borrowers who applied for the same type of loans were approved. <clears throat> now, I can tell you, the majority of black home buyers that I've helped in my real estate career were FHA loans. Very few black families that I've helped have had conventional loans. A lot of that has to do with financial literacy and being financially sound or qualified to get a conventional loan. Ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing wrong with what I'm saying. I'm only speaking facts. So those of you out there throwing darts at me because I'm telling you this, this is just based on my experience and what I've seen. Okay. The next paragraph, while many banks also approved white applicants at higher ranks, higher rates, I'm sorry, than black borrowers, the nearly 29% point gap in Navy Federal's approval rates was the widest of any of the 50 lenders that originated the most mortgage loans last year. All right, so the disparity, the disparity remains even among white and black applicants who had similar incomes and debt to income ratios. We're gonna talk about debt to income shortly. Notably, 
Navy Federal approved a slightly higher percentage of applications from white borrowers making less than $62,000 a year than it did of black borrowers making $140,000 or more. So you're wondering, whoa, black people made more money, but still got declined at a higher rate. I'll continue. A deeper statistical analysis performed by CNN found that black applicants to Navy Federal were more than twice as likely to be denied as white applicants, even when more than a dozen different variables, including debt to income, property values, down payment percentages, and neighborhood characteristics were all the same. Keep in mind, Navy Federal has about 13 million members and more than 165 billion in assets. Now, other lenders had similar variances between uh, white approval versus black approval, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, Rocket Mortgage, different state employee credit unions, Bank of America, all had these differences. Let me explain the difference to you guys between a bank and a credit union. Right. So banks are for profit institutions owned by shareholders who have an interest in making a profit. Where credit unions are nonprofit member owned cooperatives. Those who own accounts can vote board members in to speak for them and they get a say in major decisions. All right. Banks typically offer a wider selection of mortgages and home equity loan products. And credit unions, they can provide similar loan types, but their offerings may be more limited than banks. However, they can offer competitive rates for members who qualify. Um, There was a Navy federal spokesman. He said the CNN's analysts, um, their analysis does not accurately reflect Um, their practices, because it did not account for major criteria required by financial institutions to approve a mortgage loan. These factors are credit score. What did I say about credit score in a previous podcast? Credit scores can be manipulated by me and you, but they can also be manipulated by the credit bureaus, and they they can be manipulated by the banks and the lenders. But credit scores is a major factor in deciding whether you get approved or not. Another thing, available cash deposits. <coughs> Excuse me. How much money do you have in the bank? All lenders will look at that. They want to see how solvent you are. Or they want to see how much money you have in the bank to determine whether you're worthy of getting a loan. Okay. Or whether you can afford to pay this loan back after they give it to you. And here's the key part that, is extremely different between credit unions and banks. This is a key factor. Listen up. Your relationship history with the lender. I've had situations where I had four or five credit cards. Let's say I had Bank of America, Wells Fargo, um, Key, and Bank of America. And let's say I had a $500 Bank of America credit card 10 years ago. And I didn't pay it off. In fact, it went default. But I paid off all my other credit cards. Bank of America may not give me a loan. Even with an 800 credit score, they was like, nope, you you defaulted with us in the past. You're dead to us. With the credit union, it's even worse. Because now the members are saying, no, you are a risk. That part right there is very subjective. The relationship history with the lender. All right, so let me explain debt to income because in the video, it said two weeks before closing, this man was cited as having, and this is how they put it, excessive obligations in relation to his income. Two weeks before closing. Something didn't sit right with me with that. And I'll tell you why. And I'm going to tell you how explaining debt to income. And I reached out to one of my loan originating partners, Joanne Russell, the mortgage place. Want to give her a shout out. Let's say you make a monthly salary of $10,000 and you currently have 4,000 in bills in your current living situation. That includes your rent or whatever. 
Easy math. 4000 in bills, 10000 in salary. You have a 40% debt to income. Okay. Now, let's say with your new mortgage, because you've got a nice house, you decided you could afford more. Now it takes your bills up to 5000 but you still make 10000 So now you're going to be at 50%. Now, there are some lenders and loan types, FHA, VA, USDA, conventional, they all have different thresholds to debt to income. Some are 45, some are 50, some may be 55. It depends on the credit union, depends on the bank. They just have a line in the sand. It say you, if your bills are over 55% of your income or 50% of your income, no bueno. Can't do business with you. Okay? But... They give you a pre-approval. I'll get back to that in a second. <clears throat> so let's say for the sake of argument, you were sitting right at that max at 50% or 55%. <clears throat> and your lender says, oh, wow, this is close. Your debt to income is right at 50, 55%. You can't sneeze or fart because if this moves up even a point, I am not going to be able to give you a loan. It's close, but as long as you don't make any more changes in your debt other than paying stuff off, you should be good. So you got the pre-approval, you pick the house, things are going as planned, you're kissing the wife, hugging the kids, we're about to move into our new house, you're all excited. Your, real, your, your realtor forgot to tell you, shut it down. Don't put any more money on your credit cards. Don't go out and open any furniture accounts. You can't buy a new car. They forgot to tell you that. And the lender forgot to tell you that after they pre-approved you. So you go out and you buy a new car. Ooh, you're all happy. A new house is coming. You go buy a new car, a shiny new car to sit in the driveway. Or prior to closing, you'd be like, oh, man, we did measurements on the rooms. We're going to go down to the local furniture store. We're going to get some new furniture. Or your kid goes going back to college. Dad, we got to do the student loan application. Oh, that's right. So you just put $9,000 more on your credit for the new semester. And you didn't even think about the fact that you were getting this new house. <clears throat> and now the bank pulls your credit two weeks before closing and your debt to income shot up to 65%. You're going to get a declination letter. I don't care what color you are. I don't care who you are. That's just what's going to happen. And I'm sorry, but that's the way of the world. Now, since I've explained all this to you, do you see a race component? A black, white, Hispanic, Asian component here? Or did I just give you numbers and data to let you know that this could happen to anyone? When someone says, hey, something's, something's wrong with this picture, when you can't figure it out, sometimes we have the tendencies or inclination to immediately go, must be because I'm black. I know I'm going to take heat for this, but I, I, like I said, I want us to stop thinking like that as a society and ask the questions, why? So when the bank calls you and go, Mr. Wright, we're going to have to decline your loan. Whoa, why? It's been four weeks. You gave me a pre-approval. What happened? Well, we noticed that your debt to income went up to 60%. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, here it is. You opened a new credit card. I'm sorry, can't do it. So I just wanted to point this guys, point this out, guys, that I don't know if Navy Federal Credit Union is in the wrong. I'm sure they'll, you know, flush this out through their spokespeople, through the media, however they're gonna do it. As far as I know, they have a really, really good reputation. Their numbers are a little skewed. They need to fix that. Maybe they need to get some, you know, DEI in place in their in their membership, in their committees, and try and figure out how they can increase minority home ownership, close that gap for, you know, loan approvals <clears throat> between blacks, whites, Hispanics, and just come up with something that they can come out and openly say. We weren't nefarious in our thinking. We did have some systems in place that didn't sit right, but we're looking into it. But that's how I wanted to talk about that. I'll be right back. We're going to talk movies that I've seen lately. See you on the other side, guys. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back on the Real Estate Happy Hour. We're going to talk about some movies that I watched over the last week or so. 
while I was just chilling in the house trying to get better, get my health together. And one of the movies that sparked a lot of controversy, a lot of debate, people were talking about it all over the internet. There was quite a few TikTok videos about it. And that movie is Leave the World Behind. Um, it's an American apocalyptic psychological thriller. Um, it has uh, Julia Roberts in it, Mashara Ali, Ethan Hawke, Kevin Bacon, Mahela. And they're just trying to make sense of this breakdown in phones and television and technology. And um, one of the things we never think about when we think about the end of the world and how that's going to look, what that's going to look like or how that's going to happen. We never think about that it's going to end with no internet, no telephone, can't contact your loved ones, can't go on TikTok or Facebook to see what's happening. Do you guys remember a couple of years ago, Facebook was down? I don't know how long it was down, but people freaked out. Luckily, I was at work and I was busy during the whole time. and I didn't even know Facebook was down. But that night, I was all over Twitter and everybody was like, Facebook was down today for six to eight hours. I don't know what happened, but I just know that people have lost their mind. So this movie is kind of like that type, same type of situation, that that was the beginning of it. Then other weird phenomena started, started to happen and strange things where it was happening in, to the atmosphere, to the climate. Um, planes were just dropping out of the sky and crashing. <clears throat> um, but anyway, to me, great special effects, amazing movie, good CGI. But people hated it because they didn't like the last minute. Two hour and 21 minute movie and people didn't like the ending. So they said, ah, the whole thing sucked. We tend to do that. I remember it happened to the Sopranos. Sopranos faded to black. You know, Don't Stop Believing came on and people said, oh, that series sucked. Um, I remember Game of Thrones didn't end right for some people. Ah, oh, that whole series sucked. Screw that show. Guys, we got to we got to stop getting like so tied into endings and enjoy enjoy the art. OK, you don't walk through a whole art museum, get to the last painting and gone. What the frick is that? And then say the whole art museum sucked. This is an expression of one writer, one director, one screenplay writer. And that's how they wanted it to end. And I totally loved it. And I got it. And let me explain it to you a little bit. Spoiler alert. There was a little girl in there. She was addicted to the show Friends. I shouldn't say addicted. She had an, had an affection for it. She loved the characters. She cared about the characters and their outcomes. And she wanted to know how they made out. She got all the way. She watched all the seasons. Got to the final episode and said, Dad, <coughs> my tablet's stuck. I can't. Can you get me on? I can't see the last episode. She's going on vacation. And all she can think about during her whole vacation is what's happening with friends. I want to know. I want to know. Fast forward to the end. And she, spoiler alert here again. She finds her peace. I'm not going to tell you how, but she finds her peace. Watch the movie. And in that joy, that may be the last thing she ever do before she dies, because the world is literally at the end. And you know, the weird part about it is her family wasn't around. It was just her and the season finale of Friends. And I thought that was amazing. I also thought about the fact that if you had gotten that far and all of a sudden we lost all connectivity and the world came to the end, you would have never got to see the end of that movie anyway. So leave the world behind. Highly recommend it. When you get to the end, Please try and have a broader understanding, a deeper analytical look at the art and what the writer was trying to do, how he was manipulating your mind to think differently than said, and they lived happily ever after the end. You don't need that. Come on, you're adults. Grow up. All right. So the other movie that I watched that I kind of left scratching my head it was a movie called May, December. Now, the only reason I watched this movie is because I was scrolling through Netflix and I saw none other than Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore on the same cover art. Guys, I'm going to tell you, you don't even have to tell me what that movie is about. But those two, my wife will tell you too. Julianne Moore, that's my Hollywood wife. She is a babe and she can act her ass off. She's amazing. Still, Alice is still one of my favorite movies ever. But if Julianne Moore is in it, she was even in the movie Carrie, the remake of Carrie. And she was the mom. And I just thought she was amazing. But then you put Natalie Portman in there. My black swan. Uh, she So that's why I watched it. <coughs> anyway, um, May, December is actually about 
a woman who's in 36 years old who has a relationship with a seventh grader. Yep, I said it. She's 36. He was 13. And um, that was kind of odd in itself. But then I thought about other movies that were similar, like Notes on a Scandal. I think that came out in 2006. But they had Judy Dench in it and Kate Blanchett. And Kate Blanchett had a relationship with a high school student. And uh, Judy Dench, was, I think she was the headmaster or the principal. And that movie came and went. No one really said anything. Um, and then there was the movie or the series on Hulu called A Teacher that had Kate Mara in it. I think that came out a couple years ago. Um, I think 2020 that came out during the pandemic. <clears throat> and Kate Mara, she, she was a teacher who had a relationship with one of her students. Another series show that came and went. And I think that human, human human nature is to not cringe when we see adult women having relationships with adolescent boys. Call it sexist. I'm not sure what that is, but I don't think that we see it the same as if a 36-year-old man had a relationship with a 13-year-old girl. Um. People are going crazy over the NBA player on Oklahoma City Thunder. What's his name? Gidney or something like that? Anyway, uh, what's his name? Um, OKC uh, basketball star. What's that guy's name? It's just not the same. I didn't look it up. But, you know, there's a, you can see a story. Oklahoma, just type up Oklahoma City basketball player in relationship with, I think she's 18 or 17-year-old girl. And the world is losing their mind. They want him kicked out of the NBA. They want him to um, be arrested. And for God's sake, I think he's 21 and she was 17 and people are losing it. It's disgusting. I have a daughter. Aren't we going to talk about this? So there are some people on, on social media that thought this May December movie where this woman, Julianne Moore, um, started a relationship when she was 36 and with this seventh grader. And now it's really weird because I'm, I'm, I didn't do the math, but so now present day, she's like 60 and I think he's 36 or something like that. It doesn't seem as bad, but we're looking at when it started anyway. So Natalie Portman is going to, because it was, it was a big scandal. It was all in people magazine, national Enquirer, So it was a big story, not a true story. It's not a true story. This is all fiction, but Natalie Portman is going to be the actress that plays the woman who had the relationship with the seventh grader. Um, and I think people are a little bit more disturbed about this because we're more in tune. We're more attuned to those type of relationships right now. But again, we're looking at, we look at the, we look at this as art right now, where I think that if this was a movie about a 36 year old man dating a 13 year old girl, we would be totally disgusted. In fact, I doubt that Hollywood would be able to even make the movie. I don't know if it would be allowed to happen. It would be way too taboo. Um, so, but it's a really, really good film. A little cringeworthy. Um, but their relationship has lasted 23, 24 years. They had children together. She had children prior. She lost their marriage over it, the whole nine. But it was just a really, really, really good movie. So I recommend those two. Leave the world behind and May, December. All right, so we're going to finish up the day talking about politics a little bit. <clears throat> I said in a teaser video I did earlier on TikTok, I said, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I got my new voter registration card. I was really excited because for the first time in my life, <clears throat> it said no party. No party. I have untied myself from the Democratic Party but I didn't join the Republican Party. I just said, um, I'm no longer going to give unwavering support to red or blue or Democrat, Republican or conservative liberal, because I find that uh, there are a lot of issues that I'm going to align with both sides. There's certain things that I like that uh, the conservatives believe. There's certain things that I like that I believe that the liberals believe. And um, I do not want to tie myself to one party. And um, but it, it gives us a little freedom, kind of frees us up to think independently. 
And it's it, it, to the point, I didn't even want to call myself independent. So I'm glad that my card said no party versus independent because I don't even want to be tied to a certain party. I just want, I can't vote in the primaries now. Um, I can only vote in the main election and that's fine with me. Um, but I just want to be able to go in the polls, clear headed, free thinker and say, that's the guy who I think, who I think will be, do the best job for the next four years. <clears throat> okay. And, um, I think as a society, we'll all get along better if we stop tying ourselves to parties and ideas of parties and calling ourselves or labeling ourselves Democrats or Republicans or conservatives or liberals. Am I liberal? hundred percent. Am I conservative? I live a very conservative life. I have, I'm very moralistic. I'm very ethical. Does that make me, are there things I see in society that I don't like because I grew up in the sixties and seventies? I might think, I shake my head, but I, I know that to be politically correct, I can't say something or I can't do something. Reminds me of a time that um, I did a, a, a I did a talk about systemic racism. Me personally, I, I said earlier, I'm not a big, I don't believe too much in systemic racism. I don't believe too much in affirmative action. Coming from a black race, um, those are taboo. You can't you can't really say that. But I don't want to be tied to certain things. Um, my wife is white in certain circles in black America. That's taboo, but I don't like to get involved in labels or groups or different types of, you know, schisms. I am who I am. I believe who I, what I believe based on how I was, how I was raised, what I've seen, what has given me, you know, blessings and fortune and good fortitude. So I don't want to, uh, make decisions based on different groups, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm glad, very glad I freed myself of that. So uh, if you see behind me, you'll see the um, right there. Right there, there you go. That's the box set of the West Wing, <clears throat> the, the, the DVDs. And right here, I got the West Wing trivia. <clears throat> Everything I've ever learned about politics, believe it or not, didn't come from a civics class, didn't come from political science. It, it came from the West Wing, and which is why I love it so much. It's because um, I watched that series multiple times or pieces of it here and there. I just always resort back to it. And I ask, what does that mean? And why did he do that? And what happened there? Because the West Wing was based on sometimes true events and they, you know, fictionalized it, et cetera. But I, I recommend that everybody get a civics class from the West Wing because it is the most utopian experience of how politics should be and how the country should be run and how we as a society should think about politics over anything I've ever seen. I've also watched movies like John Adams or, you know, the HBO series, John Adams. I've watched anything that has to do with politics or the history of politics or America. I, I watch because um, it gives me an idea that right now we are just in a really, really weird place and it's not real. What, the way we're living politically, the way we're living as a society is not real. And I always say, Go back and watch The West Wing over there. There we go. I can't point. There we go. The West Wing and try and figure out what politics mean to America and how we should view things and how we should make decisions on voting and what our politicians should look like, act like, be like. They give us a model of Washington, D.C. and how the sausage is made and how decisions are made. So I highly recommend that. But politically, I feel free. I know there are a lot of independents out there are watching this or listening to this thinking you're late to the party. And I am late to the party. I was very naive to think that Democrats would change my life or change the life of the people that I care about. But in the same respect, I know a lot of my Republican friends. And by the way, most of my friends are Republican. Most of my people that I affiliate with probably because of my workspace, maybe because of my income, are Republican and conservative type thinkers. <clears throat> They're probably also thinking, you should have left the Democratic Party a long time ago, but at the same time, you should have joined us. But no, I don't want to join you either, because you're all crazy like foxes as well. 
So I just wanted to let you know that I'm just going to make decisions as they come. And I'm using the West Wing as my guide to say that, America, you're crazy right now. And it needs more clarity, more clear thinking, um, so we can move forward more forward more progressively. That's all I got for you guys, ladies and gentlemen, this week, the Real Estate Happy Hour. It's been a pleasure. I'm glad to be back. I um, hope you enjoyed the show. I'll see you guys next week talking more politics, movies, real estate, and likewise. Take care. Bye-bye. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to and watching the podcast, Real Estate Happy Hour. Um, I really appreciate it. But don't forget to subscribe on YouTube. Don't forget to like it. Give me a thumbs up. Also, give me five stars on the podcast. Even if you don't like it, you don't like what I got to say, give me five stars. Because if you're listening to my clips on TikTok or Reels or Facebook, you know what? The algorithm, uh, it keeps bringing me back to you. And I would really, really appreciate that. I'm putting myself out there on Front Street. I'm giving you my life as I see it. I'm giving you my worldview as I see it. So I really re would appreciate it if you support me. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you guys. See you next week on the Real Estate Happy Hour Weekly. Take care. Bye-bye.